Welcome to Progress in San Diego. Ordinary people doing extraordinary things. I'm your host, Walter Davis. And this evening, we're going to be having a discussion about medical marijuana. And I just want to bring to your attention some very startling uh, facts that you may not be aware of. The drug war in America has basically turned into a drug war against the American people. More than 15,000 people die each year in this drug war. And currently we spent, the governor spent up to $42 billion on this battle. And on the average of $52.3 billion are being spent on the drug war. Now of significance, in the 1970s, President Nixon uh, came out with the schedules for, for drugs. So schedule one drugs, for example, are drugs that have no medicinal value. In 1986, uh, President Reagan developed the minimum sentencing guidelines. And, and these laws have perpetuated into an 80% increase in the prison population since 1986. Of significance, the average sentence for people in prison now for all crimes is 56.8 months. Now, for violent crimes, the average sentence is 63 months. But for drug offenses, the average sentence is 76 months. Every 17 seconds, somebody is arrested in this country for some type of drug violation. Every 38 seconds, somebody is arrested for a marijuana violation. There are 15,000 uh, felony arrests for marijuana each year, costing more than $1 billion. Now, who benefits from this? Weapons manufacturers, uniform manufacturers, the prison system, the justice system, the lawyers, the, the judges, uh, the concrete industry, because the concrete industry is building more prisons. So they're lobbying to maintain some of the laws that we have on the books now with regard to uh, drug law enforcement. So with me this, e this evening, I have um, Mr. Eugene Davidovich and uh, Terry Best. And they are with the Americans for Safe Access San Diego chapter. And we're going to be discussing uh, medical marijuana issues going on here in the local area. So with that, uh, I'd like to open it up to you. Uh, would you like to talk about your, tell your story and talk about why you're involved with this? Absolutely. Um, well, uh, let me tell you a little bit about my background first. I, uh, um, I've lived in San Diego here for over 20 years, um, uh, four of which I was in the United States Navy, uh, stationed uh, aboard a forward deployed ship out of uh, Japan, um, did two Gulf deployments, um, and was honorably discharged. Uh, after which I completed my uh, bachelor's degree and master's degree in business um, and uh, built a successful career in, uh, as a software development uh, project manager. Um, uh, after, I, after my service, I began to develop some conditions that uh, s seriously and significantly affected my uh, quality of life and the ability to function from day to day, um, for which I found uh, tremendous uh, benefit in, in the use of medical cannabis and was uh, uh, recommended the use of medical cannabis by a physician here. And uh, um, I uh, began to uh, uh, cultivate the medication myself. And uh, when I realized I had excess, I uh, opened, uh, up, uh, 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 opened that up basically for other uh, patients to join, let's call it collective. And we decided to collectively cultivate the medication together um, in order to reduce the costs of, uh, of growing it. And, um, and uh, that's what we were uh, doing for some time until uh, a new member called us and asked to join the collective. Um, his name was Jamie Conlon. Um, that's what he went by. He uh, had a legitimate uh, recommendation from his physician, which we called and verified, um, after which we set up, uh, we, let, we let him join uh, the collective, explain how the whole thing works. He, re he told us that he couldn't grow um, himself, and so he needed uh, deliveries of medication to his home. And so that is exactly what I did as a part of the collective effort. We provided him with the medication. Um, and three months later, uh, <clears throat> my house was raided, I was arrested and charged with four felonies, um, and I'm now uh, $65,000 bail and I'm now facing jury trial 
uh, here in January. And this was all a part of uh, what's called Operation Green RX, or Operation Endless Summer. So before you go any further, now let me just paraphrase what you just said. You, you, you are a Navy veteran. Correct. Um, you developed condition. You, you had a software career, correct? Right. That's right. And you uh, developed conditions that were related to your military service, in which your doctor then authorized you to use medical marijuana, which is legal in the state of California. That's right. And in fact, uh, this week, did the government not come? We'll, we'll talk more about this, but the government came out and basically said they were not going to prosecute people as, as long as the state um, had legal medical marijuana laws, is that that's correct? That's right. The, the Obama mm -hmm. administration issued a statement mm -hmm. or actually issued instructions to uh, the Department of Justice. And the Department of Justice yesterday issued a memo um, instructing all city attorneys, uh, uh, not all city attorneys, but all the uh, att prosecuting attorneys uh, not to go after uh, uh, patients and providers in the states which have allowed the use of medical cannabis. Um, to, to put that as their lowest priority. Okay, and I want to touch base with, with Terry here in a minute. Uh, but what, what you're saying is that here in San Diego, our law enforcement officials are ignoring that and, and they're still going after people. Is that what Absolutely. what's going on? Oh, yes. Yes. Since 2003, um, uh, when Bonnie Dumanis, our district attorney, was elected into office, she formed the Narcotics Task Force, a cross-jurisdictional task force made up of uh, uh, narcotics officers and, uh, uh, from, from multiple jurisdictions here in San Diego County. And they, uh, uh, since 2003, have been clarifying Proposition 215 and the medical marijuana laws for the community here in San Diego through arrests, prosecution, um, and, and continued uh, raids every six or seven months or so. Um, so uh, here in San Diego, the, fe the federal government, the DEA and such, have, have really uh, taken a, a backseat role since 2003, since uh, uh, the district attorney here has created this. Um, and uh, uh, the district attorney has mainly been the one uh, uh, trying to eradicate uh, medical marijuana from the city outright. This is, uh, is, is very surprising. Uh, Terry, tell me about your involvement with this process, ma'am. Um, I uh, work for UCSD for the Journal of Emergency Medicine, the editorial manager there, but I also do a lot of volunteer work for UCSD. And one of the things that I do um, is I teach a harm reduction class at the UCSD Co-Occurring Disorders Program, which is a unit of the outpatient psychiatric uh, services unit in, in UCSD. And uh, I, I'm active in the drug war, um, pol in, uh, policy reform and prison reform. And when I uh, heard about uh, the stop oper or the Operation Green RX um, um, sting back in February, I decided all of the good fights have been up in, in Northern California in terms of medical marijuana. Um, there hasn't been a lot going on um, here in San Diego, so I kind of jumped at the chance when, when I heard about Eugene and uh, the other folks that got um, arrested back in February and decided to give a lot of my time to, uh, to help these people. One of the things that we really need to, um, to work on is a lot of times what happens is the DA will, will um, force people or, or um, intimidate people into uh, taking plea bargains and then she gets a conviction and this person um, who's taken the plea bargain and gets to go on with their life effectively. Well, it, in order to stop the continued prosecution, um, I decided that maybe helping people, uh, kind of supporting people so that they can choose, choose not to um, plea out uh, would be something that maybe could, be, could benefit in, um, and maybe stop the DA from getting all these, racking up all these convictions and maybe that would help. So I decided to start trying to help Eugene and uh, a few of the others that, uh, that were uh, arrested back in February and that's kind of how I got involved and it sort of evolved into the Safe Access, Americans for Safe Access um, advisory board that I'm on now and, um, and here we are. Now is this a national organization in which we have a San Diego chapter? Is that Yes. What's going on? And, and in order to get in touch with your organization again, tell me your name. Americans for Safe Access and we're the San Diego chapter. Okay. In order to get in touch with them, uh, you simply call the number that comes up at the end of the broadcast and I'll be able to give you information in terms of how to get in touch and get involved if you choose to do so. So th this is really surprising to me, you know, that we have a shortage of police officers on the street here in San Diego. We have schools closing. We have fire departments that don't have money. We, we, don't, we, we have uh, fires that burn in, in, in East County and throughout the area in which we don't have adequate resources, yet this money is being spent 
on going after people that are authorized by their doctors to use marijuana. That This is totally surprising to me. Um, and, and so now there is a grassroots effort to fight back against the, the law enforcement in, in this city. Is that what I'm understanding correctly? And, and, and what, you know, within the law, of course. Absolutely. The, uh, the, the Narcotics Task Force and uh, our district attorney has created an environment of fear that all the patients and uh, uh, medical cannabis users in general live in here in San Diego. And this environment of fear is perpetuated by these constant raids, the constant harassment and intimidation of legitimate medical cannabis patients. Um, patients are uh, harassed in their houses. Um, they, uh, when the police come in and do the raids, uh, they uh, don't care about whether you have a um, proper amount of plants or, or not a proper amount or uh, whether you're within state law or not. It's, uh, um, according to them, it's all illegal. And, it's, uh, and, and, and the people have decided to speak out against that. Uh, medical cannabis has, in fact, been a legitimate medication um, in the state of California since 96, for over 13 years now. Um, and it's about time that uh, our law enforcement uh, caught up to those laws and to uh, what's happening uh, in California, specifically in San Diego today. Um, in 96, San Diego County overwhelmingly passed Proposition 215 itself here. Um, however, since then, we've had nothing but um, an, a very uh, organized effort to, uh, to eradicate it completely. What is Prop 215? Talk about that, please. Proposition 215 was the Compassionate Use Act. That is um, the measure that allowed uh, for uh, patients to use uh, cannabis as a medicine legally in California. It was passed um, in uh, 1996. Um, and uh, several years after that, there was Senate Bill 420, uh, which was uh, passed in 2003, which uh, actually uh, provided for the ID card program for each uh, county to issue the ID card program, it also set uh, limits on how much patients could possess. Um, those limits specifically are currently under question um, as far as uh, it being legal to set limits for patients. And that case is, uh, could possibly be heard by the California Supreme Court soon. Um, so uh, Proposition 215 uh, basically allowed uh, the use of medical cannabis, and SB 420 since then um, uh, re uh, re basically uh, it, it reinstilled it. Uh, in the, uh, in the laws, codified it into the health and safety codes. But it's simply amazing that it would be legal in the state of California. We have a federal government that's, that's backing down in terms of prosecution, yet we have a local government that's pursuing people. How can that happen? Terry, can, can you, how does that, how do they get away with that? Well, I think that, uh, in my opinion, uh, Bonnie DeManis is an opportunist. She's um, taking advantage of the fact that the laws are very murky right now and arresting them all and letting the court sort it out and then in, in the process intimidating people into taking plea bargains so that her uh, conviction rate gets plumped up. So I think that's what, what, what really is happening right now. Until the laws become crystal clear, I think she'll continue to take advantage of, uh, of the murky laws. Well, I'm confused now. now you say murky law. Is there a local statute that allows the local government to go around? In other words, what makes it murky? Uh, the the writing on the, uh, the in Proposition Two Fifteen is not crystal clear. There seems to be some um, some contention about whether or not people can open up a storefront and advertise. Um, uh, that makes it murky. The DA is in opposition to that. She doesn't believe that that, that is uh, legal. And um, she's taking advantage of the fact that people are doing that because 215 says allows for it. She disagrees. She's taking advantage of the, of the murkiness there. Okay, so we need people to stand up and speak out against the, the murkiness and get, get clarity right. on, on the books. Now, Tell me, what kind of people would be utilizing marijuana? What kind of medical conditions would qualify one to use medical well, marijuana? Well, the, the Compassionate Use Act uh, authorized the use of medical cannabis for a variety of conditions, including um, AIDS, glaucoma, cancer, migraines, insomnia, anxiety, and any other condition that a physician may find beneficial uh, with the use of cannabis. So that, that is what the Compassionate Use Act says. So thinking out of the box, on this, we have people buying alcohol. We have people dying from drinking alcohol. We have liquor stores on almost every other corner. 100,000 people a year die from alcohol consumption. 
and we have over 400,000 people dying from smoking cigarettes. I mean, it's simply amazing that uh, marijuana has some good things that it, that it offers. Uh, however, it's under this type of scrutiny, and people have been using it for millions of years, right? I mean, it just doesn't seem to make any sense to me that we're ruining lives. Because with a felony, I mean, that's not, you said plea bargain, but with a felony, that's not a, a light thing. I mean, you can't get a job. You, 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 you can't vote for a period, of course, if you're, if you're on uh, probation, right? I mean, so there's a lot of things going into this. The, the lives are being destroyed. So this is not a light issue. Absolutely. And, and you said legal fees, you were what, $60,000? $65,000 in bail. That's uh... $65,000 in bail. So this has had a dramatic impact. Absolutely. It's completely financially bankrupted me. Um, since in February this has happened as a result of it, I've lost my job, my family, there's all sorts of uh, uh, problems that, that, that arose. Uh, mainly uh, the cause of it all was uh, the mistruths spread by the district attorney. In fact, in February, uh, when Operation Endless Summer was announced, it was announced on uh, the local uh, news media and everywhere uh, as a, a big drug sting that they had uh, accomplished. And they showed uh, my face, I just happened to have court that day, they showed my face in court uh, be at my arraignment, and they basically uh, tied me in as the poster child of uh, Operation Endless Summer, well, um, uh, in which they announced that they had seized uh, all sorts of other drugs and guns and all sorts of things, none of which um, I'm even alleged to have possessed or I'm even being accused of, uh, of having. So what ended up ha happening is uh, my uh, uh, I was shown on television as a part of Operation Endless Summer, and then they also showed images of all these uh, uh, illegal uh, drugs and guns and, and, and such. Uh, with no mention, of course, of medical cannabis on television, um, and they ran with it, the news. So uh, the next day I come to, uh, to work, uh, and uh, people ask me, you know, we saw you on the news, uh, drugs, guns, you know. <laughs> As you can imagine, uh, my life uh, took a very drastic change ever since that day. You're working with computers, so obviously you're handling information, so they're not going to allow anyone that is using drugs actively to be in a position of handling sensitive information. Absolutely. Um, the issue with, uh, uh, with that was, was some of the customers that I was working with uh, and doing these large-scale projects for um, could risk finding out that this is what uh, I'm being charged with and such, and as a result, uh, I was forced to resign. So. I are you terrible for you know, seeing this opportunity and being able to help people. That's what we're all about here, and, and that's what we want to do on this particular broadcast. You talked about how the media just hammered you, putting the guns and everything. So, so here on Progress in San Diego, we want to bring forth people that uh, don't normally get covered so that you can tell your story. We, we're working with citizens. We're broadcasting on the internet right now. And so you can even interact with us on this show. Um, you can come aboard and, and uh, you know, voice your opinion as we are broadcasting live around the world. Um, so again, this is a real tragedy. And we're gonna get more into your story in part two of, uh, of, this, of this sequel. Um, Madam, do you have more that you wanted to add about this topic at all? Something well, you want to discuss? What's passionate, what's close to my heart is the uh, recovery community in San Diego. And like I said, I did the, um, the harm reduction uh, group for the UCSD co-occurring Dis disorders program. And what we found oftentimes and what, what gets missed is that people can substitute one more, um, one less harmful substance for another. But in, in the recovery community, it isn't something that, uh, that is considered um, a positive change. And I, I, I think harm reduction, it really has, um, has taken off in Europe and in Canada. But in San Diego, we're very, very backward about it. And I, I really do want to make a plug for the fact that if you can take somebody who's, whose um, life has been seriously interrupted with the use of heroin or crack cocaine or um, one of the other drugs that really seriously has some, some, um, some very damaging components to, to the quality of life and replace it with a less harmful or you know, sometimes completely unharmful um, drug like, uh, like cannabis, that's, that's a positive change that can be celebrated. And uh, the recovery community kind of needs to open up their minds to the fact that there's uh, there are certain things that uh, um, that are a lot less, much less harmful than uh, than others. And drugs, uh, mar uh, cannabis should not be lumped in um, as a Schedule One drug in, in the recovery community's mind because it is not a harmful drug like um, some of the others. And I, I would really like to get that message across. 
So th there, there are really some surprising uh, allies in this. I, you're saying the recovery community, but we're also looking at law enforcement. So it seems that there is a agreement of, of some sorts between these two groups that continues to perpetuate this illogical situation. Is that basically what you're saying here? Uh, yeah, there, it, there's, a, like I said, th that oftentimes um, cannabis is lumped in uh, as a, as a, with the other drugs as a harmful drug, and um, it doesn't have to be, it has to be teased out and sorted out and, uh, and um, celebrated for its, for, its, um, for its qualities that it does have and thus uh, vilified for the qualities that it really doesn't have. I mean, there isn't, there, I, I have not met a single person who uses cannabis whose life has become unmanageable. I haven't so met anybody like that. Certainly, when we look at other drugs, alcohol is a drug, people don't tend to look at that as being a drug. Mm -hmm. uh, cigarettes have nicotine, that's, that's a drug. Uh, and we see, we see the really negative aspects of utilizing cigarettes and nicotine. We see the very negative aspects of, of alcohol, alcohol consumption. Uh, yet, there are proven statistics that medical use of marijuana is beneficial. As you mentioned, migraine, headaches, uh, glaucoma, right. cancer. We have people that have been burned in the, in the fires here in San Diego that have found the, the medical marijuana use to be of great benefit. Um, and, and thinking of the box, we have some opponents of this. Would it not be companies like Tylenol, for example, these pain-killing uh, uh, drug companies, right? And, and also, um, the alcohol industry doesn't want any competition in, in terms of, of, of marijuana coming out in, in, in large scale. Uh, the concrete industry doesn't want to see people not go to jail anymore. So we have lobbying efforts going on with our politicians. And so our politicians could be uh, acting to get money and not on behalf of the citizens here. So we as the citizens have to hold them accountable. And it is simply ridiculous to me, again, I just find it so amazing and it makes me so angry to hear that using medical marijuana is legal in the state of California. Totally amazing. And yet locally people are being prosecuted. and. We have the federal government standing down from, from arresting people. This is simply an amazing situation that is unbelievable to me. Yes, it, what's, I think what's even more amazing is that the district attorney comes out publicly on television and makes statements such as uh, that, that she supports the use of medical cannabis, that she uh, supports compassion. Uh, however, at the same time, she's conducting 14 or 15 raids on legitimate patients. Um, when they come into the collectives or cooperatives that are being uh, uh, under investigation or being raided, uh, they don't just go after the person uh, that's uh, operating the place or that's the manager there. No, they, they take everybody down on the floor in handcuffs, uh, out of their wheelchairs, uh, to kicking canes down. Um, there's video footage of Paul Cody, um, uh, who's a medical cannabis patient and a part of Hillcrest Compassion Care Collective here in San Diego that was dragged out of his wheelchair during one of these raids and stuffed into a police car. Um, it, it, it is absolutely unreal what's happening with uh, our local law enforcement here in San Diego, specifically the Narcotics Task Force, who, um, as you mentioned a little about, about the lobbying efforts of, of different groups, uh, this, uh, this Narcotics Task Force, every officer in it is trained by the California Narcotic Officers Association, who is a uh, nonprofit lobbying organization that um, provides the majority of uh, narcotics officers training here in California. Well, their training material clearly states that marijuana is not a medicine. And this is what the narcotics officers learn here. So uh, they take that knowledge and then they apply it on the streets, they apply it on patients, they apply it on collectives and cooperatives, um, and, and, and they perpetuate that environment of fear. So this, these lobbying organizations absolutely help you know, perpetuate that environment. That's absolutely terrible. Uh, we're down to our last two minutes or so uh, of this interview. Um, I want to encourage the audience uh, to come back and watch ne next week for part two uh, of this interview. There's so much information that we have to cover that we can't do it in the 28 minute time frame that we have here. I really appreciate you uh, coming out and, and providing this great information to the public and we'll continue on with the second part of this interview very shortly. Um, at the website at the end of the broadcast uh, for the coalition you'll see uh, 
a, a link in which you can find out more about Americans with safe access to San Diego, uh, safe access rather, uh, San Diego chapter. And uh, we'll be posting their events in terms of your, your events that you have upcoming. I know that you get involved with, with protests and other types of things and that you have some uh, policy actions that you're taking. Uh, and I hope to be able to keep your uh, events on the community coalition schedule because that's what we're all about here. Uh, you're also encouraged uh, to come out and join our television crew here and join the community coalition and, and our fight for freedom, for justice, for human rights, for the environment. These are the kinds of things that we're standing for here. Uh, we're putting the power of the media back into the hands of everyday citizens here. We have just started our fifth uh, production uh, with Mr. Javen Jackson, who will be who will be coming on, uh, you know, in, in the in the near future. He's one of the people that's been uh, working on our crew. All of the people that are behind the camera here are volunteers. They're everyday citizens, and you can become part of the San Diego County Community Coalition and our television series. We also broadcast live on the internet. We webcast our our shows, and maybe we can tell your story. You can come aboard here, and uh, if you have a story, uh, please contact us. We want to work with and for you in terms of informing the community. So thank you very much for joining us and please come back next week for part two uh, of the interview that we're doing here involving the use of medical marijuana. My name is Walter Davis and thank you.